Good evening, everybody. Take your seats. My name is Jeremy Weinstein. I'm a professor of political science, and I'm the director of Stanford Global Studies. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the SGS annual student dinner. This is our fifth year of doing this dinner, and it's a wonderful opportunity for us to bring together students from across campus, undergraduates, graduate students who are affiliated with different area studies programs, interdisciplinary degree programs, master's programs, uh, but all sharing a common interest in issues that transcend borders that are associated with different parts of the world that often don't enter into the core curriculum that you might find uh, in a given class on campus. So we applaud your interest and commitment to that set of issues and are really pleased to welcome you tonight and to celebrate you uh, at this annual dinner. We've used these dinners as an opportunity to expose students who are interested in different parts of the world or in some of these cross-cutting issues to some unbelievable leaders who are working as activists, as journalists, as scholars, investigating or tackling critical issues in regions where we have strength as a university. Um, and so Uganda tonight or issues on the African continent may not be what you're focused on if you're traditionally interested in Latin America or East Asian studies or international relations. But by having Nicholas with us tonight, you get the opportunity to see some of these issues as they're playing out uh, where some of your colleagues may be focused on this part of the world even if you haven't been focused on it traditionally. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Nicholas Opio. He's an extraordinary civil rights activist. We're unbelievably blessed to have him with us tonight. He is a lawyer, a civil rights activist. He leads an organization in Uganda called Chapter 4 that has been working on some of the most contentious issues in Ugandan politics over the last decade, from issues related to torture, issues related to the constitutional future of the country, the question of whether the sitting head of state can continue to stand for election and change critical aspects of the Constitution to keep himself in power, really highly contentious issues around the rights of LGBTQ populations on the African continent and in Uganda in particular. And he has an extraordinary personal story that has driven him to do this work that relates to growing up in a part of Uganda that was afflicted with horrific violence committed not only by the Lord's Resistance Army, but also by the government of Uganda in northern Uganda during his childhood that affected his own, his own family and also turned him into someone who wanted to get, dedicate his life to civil rights and to human rights. Uh, and so we're extraordinarily blessed to have him with us. He's been the recipient of too many awards to name, but rather than name the awards, I just wanted to read some of the quotes that people use to describe him, people who've given these awards to Nicholas for his work. So he was the recipient of the Alison DeForge Award uh, from Human Rights Watch. This is an award named after an unbelievable woman who's no longer with us, who had dedicated her life to understanding what had happened with the Rwandan genocide and bringing to light the violence that was committed inside this country. And so when he was given this award in her honor by Human Rights Watch, they said, Nicholas's clear-eyed commitment to justice and non-discrimination, his passion and positivity are infectious. Those who work with him and benefit from his knowledge and dedication are better off for having listened to him. And a couple years ago, he received the German Africa Prize, and the former president of Germany, Germany Frank uh, Walter Steinmeier, said, Nicholas, you have become a key figure for your country's democratic development, and your courageous fight for equal rights has been giving hope to so many people in Uganda and beyond. And I just want to add a bit of a personal note to my introduction, which is when I decided to get a PhD and started doing research for my dissertation, the first country I went to was Uganda. And I located myself in Kampala, Uganda, and I was really interested in this country that hadn't really been at the center of the study of African politics up to that point. People were focused on Zimbabwe or South Africa or Kenya, Senegal, major, major kinds of powers, Ethiopia on the African continent. But Uganda was in the midst of, at that point, you know, a quite fascinating set of political developments that began with the overthrow of a corrupt regime, a civil war that succeeded 
in the victory for a rebel movement. They were implementing a system that at that point was called no party democracy because they believed that people should have the right to vote, people should have the right to choose their leaders, but they shouldn't make those choices on the basis of the tribal and ethnic labels that had so dominated uh, Ugandan politics up to that point. They developed their constitution through a constituent assembly where people were elected to debate the terms of the constitution. It was an incredibly uh, optimistic moment for Uganda's political life and evolution. Here we are 33 years after Yoweri Museveni came to power in 1986, and the story is not so positive. The story is one of the changing of a constitution, crackdowns on independent media, opposition politics, attacks on marginalized groups. And in that kind of environment, one could be incredibly pessimistic about the turn of events that have happened in this country. But it never, you know, sort of, I'm always amazed by the fact that when I interact with Nicholas and others who are doing this kind of work, that he's so motivated by the goal that he and his colleagues are trying to achieve in Uganda that they see the justness of their cause and they put their head down and they continue to do this work. And so I think it's an extraordinary opportunity for us tonight as we think about the challenges in Uganda, we think about the challenges in different regions uh, that you might be studying or working in, or we think about the challenges at home here in the United States uh, to have the opportunity to hear from someone who's dedicated his life to the pursuit of justice and the protection of human and civil rights. So Nicholas, we're so pleased to have you. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy, for a very warm introduction. You have uh, summarized uh, quite eloquently the history of Uganda's politics and uh, the optimism that many of us had uh, when Museveni came to power. Uh, thank you very much for that int introduction. I must admit from the very onset that a part of me is divided, uh, whether I should stand here and speak this, this evening or should follow my Twitter feeds to follow what's happening in Uganda. Because in just a few hours, the Supreme Court in Uganda will deliver a landmark decision that we've all been waiting for for the last four months. Uh, that decision is about whether President Museveni can still contest for elections uh, in 2021. You see, about two years ago, the president set on a path to amend the constitution to lift the only impediment to him contesting for elections having removed all others before that, including term limits, he was coming up against an age limit that would have barred him from contesting for elections in the next election. So he set upon a process of amending the constitution and in doing so, succeeded. What was heart-wrenching is the manner in which he went about doing it. For the first time in the history of our country, soldiers stormed the floor of parliament and beat opposition MPs to pulp. Many of them are still nursing uh, the injuries they sustained in that beating. Some of them uh, will be disabled for their lives. And in that process, the constitution was amended and allowed the president to contest for elections for as many times as he wanted. That process was challenged in the courts. We had a small role to play in it. And uh, the Constitutional Court gave a judgment uh, last year. And that judgment is uh, coming up for a final uh, decision uh, from the Supreme Court. So a part of me feels like I should sit down, look at my, you know, my feeds, uh, and see what's happening. Um, but I'm also happy to be here to share with you the story uh, of, of Uganda. Stories that many of you would never have a chance to read, perhaps, uh, for your life. And this is the story of a beautiful country. And those who have been there uh, can testify just how beautiful the country is. Good weather, good food, good people, good history. And um, an abundance of wildlife, 
uh, it's on the equator, it's a beautiful country. But that in spite of its beauty, the country suffers from many, uh, many things, including uh, bad governance. Uh, the country is still reliant on aid for much of its uh, national budget. The country, um, uh, which was promising to be a beacon of hope in the region, is uh, increasingly becoming more autocratic and a basket case in many respects. That is the country that I live in. And you may ask, um, what drives you then to do what you do if the country is autocratic? I've been asked this question far too many times that in telling it, I feel uh, like I'm playing the music back to myself. But I will tell it to you again. The reason I do what I do is really because of my history. You see, I was born and raised in northern Uganda. And northern Uganda uh, was the epicenter of a very brutal conflict between a rebel group called the Road Resistance Army and the government of Uganda. Growing up in that area meant that I was a front row witness to cases of human rights violation from as young an age as five. I was what you used to call night commuters. Jeremy would know this. These were young children who trekked uh, miles every day to find safe shelter in open public spaces in the heart of the city in northern Uganda, in the hope that they would survive being abducted by a vicious rebel group whose method of growing its numbers was the abduction of young children into rebel ranks. So I was that child sleeping on the street. Back then it was fun, I can tell you this, it was really fun. Um, I think as a child, you just kind of forget what you're living in and, and just try to enjoy the moment. It was fun because we would do the things we never do at home when our parents were watching. You know, you'd play the games you'd never play at home. Um, you'd go to bed, well, if there's a bed anyway, you'd go to sleep uh, when you wanted to. But in that situation was a very uh, difficult life, uh, sleeping in open public spaces, um, every day walking miles, in the morning to go to you know, primary school and in the evening uh, to walk back to find your place to sleep uh, in a bus park, in a you know, church corridor, church veranda, uh, and, and, and in many places. The second thing was that then you had every day uh, seen, had to see cases of dead bodies, people who have been shot and killed on the streets in the night, people who have um, their heads cut off, their limbs cut off. And this became normal, you know, you'd see it and just walk past it. And, and, and this leaves a mark in your mind as a child and, and sends you, you know, asking questions about why this and, and why uh, these things were happening. When I grew older and went to an O-level school, I was lucky to go to a boarding school, a small school called St. Joseph's College, Laibi, on the outskirts of Gulu Town. Now, you'd think going to a a boarding school would give you some safety. But that wasn't the case. We still had to study for very short times of the day because oftentimes you'd have to flee uh, hearing that rebels were approaching your school. Our school was a boys' school. So it was a target for, for rebels to come and recruit uh, the young boys in my school uh, into their ranks. And so we would still, as, as a teenager, have to run into town and then go and sleep in open public spaces. There was a very funny story that I like to tell. One night when we were sleeping, we had known to sleep with our shoes on. Uh, you, we had known to sleep you know, uh, with your clothes on because any time it's time for running. But before we knew that, one night uh, in the deep of my sleep, you woke up and just had people running. You didn't ask why they were running, you just ran. So I ran for about four miles and when we stopped, and we discovered that I was stuck naked, you know, completely naked as a teenager. Uh, luckily, uh, a lady that I don't even know gave me a, what we call a lesu uh, to tie myself. Yeah. But that, that, that was our lives, growing up and trying to avoid abduction. As if the crimes committed by rebel groups weren't enough, we also had to do with crimes being committed against our people by government forces. For me, the picture I have in my mind is March the 6th 
1988 when my father, a tall, dark British train, 92 year old now, was picked up by government soldiers for no reason but just being an adult in Gulu town and severely beaten, frog marched into a stadium and made to sleep in the, in the open while it rained for three days. Uh, as a young child, your father is, is the big figure in your, in your life, so watching your father go through this was traumatizing. I watched my mother line up for relief food from World Food Program, from Norwegian Refugee Council, from USID. And back in the days, the larger your family, the more food ratios you'd get. So my father was blessed. He had uh, more than 40 children. He had about three wives. And so he would line all of us to go and line up you know, to show just why he needed more food uh, than, 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 than everybody else uh, in that place. It was humiliating uh, to see that happen. And growing up in that environment just sent me on a search for meaning, search for what life is about and what I could do um, to change my lot. And in that search, I wanted to be a journalist. I really wanted to tell the story of what was happening um, uh, in, my, in my neighborhood. And I thought that by being a journalist, I would tell the story, the world would know, and something would happen. So I began to get interested in listening to uh, news programs, reading newspapers, uh, writing short stories in my school newsletter. Uh, but I also wanted to be a journalist for another reason. There was a very young um, a white lady called Anna Buzello, who was a BBC correspondent at the time. Anna Buzello would report the news from my district, and I would see her in the day, and I would hear her on the radio in the evening. So I wanted to be like Anna Buzello and tell the story on the BBC. But the story is even more interesting because the BBC was my father's way of teaching me to speak English. My father would leave his box, Sony Radio, and ask you to listen to the BBC Focus on Africa program at 6 in the evening. And you would have to tell him what was on the news. So you can imagine a village boy struggling to listen to a British accent of uh, a guy called Robin White. Um, what that did to me was it exposed me to what was happening around the world, inspired in me the urge to become a journalist, but more importantly, um, taught me um, that I could do more than what I was seeing in my neighborhood. So I wanted to be a journalist, and I began to write, I began to, you know, uh, take part in public affairs. But that dream was quickly dashed when I discovered that telling my story alone wouldn't change my situation. And therefore, I went on a search to become a lawyer. And I did become a lawyer, really by one, sheer luck, uh, but two, because of the generosity of many people across the world. My father, with his numerous wives and many children, was unable to pay my uh, school fees to go to law school. But some people came together. and through their support, got me through law school. Now, as a young lawyer, you thought, wow, all is good, I'm now a lawyer, I'm going to wear fancy suits, I'll do fancy cases, I'll be respected in my communities. But it quickly dawned upon me that I was a privileged child to have gone through law school. See, I wasn't the best in my class. There were many kids who used to beat me who never had the chance to go to law school. But I went to law school. And so I resolved that I should use my law degree and my skills as a lawyer to defend the rights of vulnerable people in my country. And I spent all my early years just working in northern Uganda, uh, helping uh, women who were fighting for their land rights or fighting domestic violence. I was working on the Legal Aid Project of the Law Society then, providing pro bono services to rural uh, Uganda in northern Uganda. Then um, when that got exciting, I grew in career and joined um, one of the leading human rights organizations in Uganda called the Foundation for Human Rights Initiative, where I was a researcher, a human rights uh, advocacy officer. That was exciting. Um, but as I practiced the law, what I confronted as a child came right back in my face. Cases of grave violations for human rights. In an attempt to hold on to power, the regime in Kampala has unleashed upon its nationals uh, violence, uh, blocking peaceful demonstrations, jailing uh, people who are seen as 
dissidents or who are seen as uh, disagreeing with the regime in Kampala. Uh, so many people have lost their lives. And I felt I should dedicate my life to defending this kind of people. And so we've done uh, numerous cases in our attempt to try and defend the rights of individuals uh, in, in my country. So I'll speak about two cases uh, just to illustrate the point. The first is the case of Thomas Koyelo. Thomas Koyelo was a rebel commander with the Lord's Resistance Army. He was abducted as a child and was captured by the UPDF in a war uh, in Eastern DRC about 11 years ago. Thomas Koyelo came from my part of the country, from the village where my father um, cut his teeth as a teacher in his early years. And so Thomas Koyelo's father requested my dad to ask me to represent him. It was the most agonizing decision of my life, given the fact that Thomas Koyelo was involved in the abduction of my own sister, who spent several years as a sex slave within the LRA ranks. But we took up his case. And I was among the first defense lawyers in the war crimes court in Uganda, defending the right of a rebel commander to a fair trial before a court system. That case, 10 years later, hasn't concluded and is still in pretrial detention uh, for various reasons. But I took up that case in spite of my own difficulties because I believe very strongly that those faced with any crime before a court of law, regardless of the crime, are entitled to due process. And that if, if we allowed Thomas Coyello to be unfairly treated, who knows who next will be unfairly treated. Um, so for 10 years, I was part of his legal team defending him before the war crimes court. That, that case is still going on before the courts in Uganda. I faced difficulties from my own family. Why do you take on these kind of cases? Um, but because I believe very strongly in the principle of fair trial, the principle of uh, a good judicial system, I offered my services to help him for free. The second case that I want to share with you is perhaps a case many of you have read, and I share this uh, with a lot of reservations, the challenge against the country's anti-gay law. In 2009, a combination of American evangelical groups inspired Ugandan legislators to enact a law that became known in the West as the Kill the Gay Bill, a law that provided for imprisonment for just who you love, for sanctions against organizations providing services to the country's LGBTI community. A law that would have required uh, in its early stages when it was proposed that doctors, teachers would have to disclose the sexual identity of their students, of their patients and their clients. We took up this case as part of a broader legal team. Um, I wasn't the only one involved in this case. There were many other people involved. But the reason I tell you this story is to express to you the personal difficulties you have to go through in handling this kind of cases. In taking up this case, I was at the time the Secretary General of the National Bar Association. I was quite a big guy in the National Bar Association. But for taking up this case, a section of the Law Society uh, called the Uganda Christian Lawyers Fraternity mobilized uh, to get me out of office in the Law Society. And at the annual General Assembly, in 2014 um, got me uh, ejected from my office as the SG of the Law Society. At a very personal level, at a family level, I had people who in my family disowned me as a, a disgrace to the family uh, for taking up these cases and defending the country's LGBTI community. I had people confront me and spit in my face in public and accuse me of being an agent of Western powers. Um, I wish I had received money from Western Powers to do this case. <laughs> maybe, maybe I would suffer. I would suffer with a smile. <laughs> but nothing could have been further from the truth. We were simply moved by our desire to defend the country's LGBTI community. And thankfully, in 2014, we won the case. And so we do work in a very difficult political environment. There are activists who are being imprisoned because of posting on social media. As I speak now, a university professor, Dr. Stella Nyanzi, has been in jail since November of last year for posting in perhaps very colorful language um, 
uh, stuff about the president uh, on social media. We have young people who are being uh, prosecuted for just good banter on social media about the president. We have in Uganda now an attempt to try and limit access to social media. On several occasions, the president just shut down social media and mobile money uh, in times when he thought social media would be used to mobilize people uh, in the country. He also imposed the tax on the use of social media. In Uganda now, to be able to access Facebook or any other social media platform, you have to pay a daily tax. That is besides the tax you pay on, uh, on, uh, on uh, data. Uh, uh, you have to pay what is called an over-the-top tax. So we do work in a very toxic environment, but this environment allows us a little bit of room to do what you can do. And that is where I think the nuances are important. That President Museveni in the West is hailed as a progressive partner in the fight against terrorism. He's been the first African leader to deploy Ugandan troops in Somalia to fight Al-Shabaab. We have uh, an open door policy for refugees to come in from all over the region. Um, and in many senses, those are good things he's done. But the flip side is that that has placated him from real criticism about domestic politics and what he's doing in the country. He's beating up opponents. He organizes elections that only he can win. Uh, just a couple of days ago, a leading opposition leader was speaking at a radio station, just speaking on a radio station, not even holding a rally. The police fired tear gas in the studio of the, of the radio station and switched off the radio as a whole for many hours. They are unable to organize rallies and be able to mobilize people. At the end of last year, we were defending a young musician who had just captivated the imagination of the people in the country, the Honorable Robert Chagolani, popularly known by his stage name as Bobby Wine. Bobby Wine has survived three attempts at his life. On two occasions, people close to him were shot and killed, including his driver. He's unable to hold music concerts. I was on the phone with him just a couple of days ago. He's planning to hold music concerts for the Easter season. And the police have just blocked him from just taking the stage to sing. He's facing charges of treason before the High Court in Uganda for simply uh, leading a by-election that humiliated the president. Uh, um, uh, and he lost in, 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 in that part of the country. And so while the situation in Uganda is as dire as I describe it, there's still some space uh, for which uh, lawyers can do what they do, NGOs can do what they can do. It is part of the cleverly weaved process of giving a semblance of democracy uh, in Uganda. You have courts giving you sometimes very good decisions, and I hope that the ruling today is one of those good decisions. But many times, the courts are aware in matters where the president is personally interested, uh, you would have difficulties uh, getting a good judgment. The impact of a nearly 34-year rule in power means that every single judicial officer in our court system is appointed by the president. Every one of them owes the appointment to Mr. Museveni. And many of them uh, um, are party cadres. Uh, many of them owe allegiance to him and, and, and his rule. Uh, and in that situation, it makes it extremely difficult to uh, expect uh, a good decision from the court. Uh, but nonetheless, we have been able to use the court, in my view, for three reasons. Even if we know that sometimes we don't get good judgments from the courts, we still go to the courts because we use the courts not just as a place to win a court judgment, but to create a public record and shape public narratives around particular issues. We also use the courts to give voice to victims who otherwise would never, never be heard in any place in that country. Take, for example, the case of the Ugandan gay community. It's extremely difficult to even hold a meeting like this if you're in a meeting like this, the police would storm it and, and break it up and, and, and charge people uh, with all kinds of crimes. 
And so we use the courts as a space for advocacy, for shaping narrative, and for giving voice to victims. So regardless of whether the courts are free and fair or not, we still see the four walls of the courthouse as a good space, uh, as a springboard for uh, what we can do in the country. And so I was asked to speak for 20 minutes. It's 23 minutes. Uh, <laughs> my apologies. Uh, I could go on and on the whole evening, but I think it is best to stop here and perhaps leave the rest for a Q&A. And thank you so much for listening to me. I appreciate it. There will be dessert, just in case anyone's concerned. That would typically be the first question that my kids would ask. I want to tell you that Nicholas is the dessert, but no, in fact, through that door, when we finish up our Q&A, there will be a dessert buffet and some more time to mingle. But first, let's take the opportunity that we have with Nicholas to investigate further some of the issues that he raised. And I'm going to start with, with two questions that are on my mind before opening it up to the group. So let me ask the first one. So you, you kind of laughingly talked about yourself as potentially described as an agent of Western powers. You kind of wished you were an agent of Western powers because maybe it would come with a four-wheel drive vehicle and a security detail and a swimming pool and all the other things that Western powers have uh, in Kampala. But, but I want to... I want to investigate that a little bit further because especially around these LGBTQ issues, there was extraordinary sensitivity inside the Ugandan domestic political environment about the role of the West, not only in sort of shaping a climate in which homosexuality, right, or, uh, you know, the sort of behavior that that, that the sort of Ugandan law was designed to, to prevent, um, that the West was somehow associated with creating that community. Um, but also, I think challenges, because I was serving in the Obama administration at the time from the perspective of the president and our senior team about whether there were effective ways for the United States to stand in solidarity with activists on the ground and with vulnerable communities without further creating this narrative that you know, the West was somehow imposing a set of values on a Ugandan political community that wasn't accepting of those things. And obviously Museveni was happy to, to sort of encourage those kinds of critiques. So I think it'd be useful to hear a bit from your perspective, how do you think about the role of Western countries, the role of the United States, in the context of these very contentious debates about, as you said at our table, not gay rights, but human rights, right? Um, especially when it's such an effective political tool for those who want to marginalize or undermine the activists or the people who themselves are suffering. Well, first of all, let me just give a shout out to the Africa Table team here. They've been my home. <laughs> um, they have been my home since I came here in um, January. So shout out to Laura and all the good guys, uh, Thierry and all of you guys. Um, to your question, Jeremy, first and foremost, I think that we should not be blind to the context in which this discussion is being had. This discussion takes place within a political climate that is yearning for a scapegoat to deflect public attention from its democratic records in the country. The LGBTI community is just one of those communities. And to focus only on that community uh, would be to, to play along with what the regime in Kampala would want to do. I think that Western countries that are partners to the Ugandan state in their economic geopolitical interest or even security interest must be invested in democratic governance and practice as a whole as opposed to LGBTI rights precisely because of the context in which these things happen. The second reason is then that if you only concentrate and that is a mistake I think that 
uh, if you had to say something negative about uh, the Obama administration and many other Western countries did, was to focus on the LGBTI issue as the most important issue and play into the narrative and turn communities against uh, LGBTI groups. For example, in protest of some of the things they did, like suspending aid, uh, public condemnation of, uh, of the country's leadership, uh, those things were in some way, in somewhat, uh, counterproductive. And so I think that critical investments must be made not just in the LGBTI debate, which is a very small part of the equation, but on the overall human rights and democratic system in the country. The American Embassy in Kampala gives us every year what they call their report to the Ugandan people. If you see where the a vast majority of its investment goes, it's to issues of climate change, which is great, uh, healthcare, education, uh, and not an equal amount of investment and time uh, uh, on human rights and, uh, and, uh, and the rule of law. So I think that we must, first of all, approach that from that context. The second broad uh, thought that I would have in that regard is to say, this is really our struggle. We know the context, we know the issues, we know the nuances. We know the drivers that uh, make our leaders do the things they do. And in trying to help push back on these issues, Western powers must not be a replacement for local voice and activism, because that's really their, it's, it's their, their, it's their lived experience. It is what they know, it is what they live every day, so they, they know best how to approach it. So any support from Western governments and powers must not be to replace local activists, but support them to be the ones to lead the uh, campaign against uh, homophobia, especially in the case of Uganda. Lastly, I think that there is a lot of leverage at the, you know, in the hands of Western governments that they don't use enough. And I'll give you an example. In the middle of this discussion about the country's LGBTI law in 2013, when the State Department issued this powerful statement against Ms. Seven, the US ambassador in Uganda then, Scott DeLisi, had a tremendous interview on the BBC. You had military generals from AFRICOM in Germany decorating Ugandan soldiers in Kampala. It felt as though, for those of us who are on the ground, it felt as though uh, in the USG, uh, State Department was not speaking to DOD. And, and, and while the uh, State Department was condemning uh, Museveni for what he had done, uh, Museveni's generals were being decorated and, you know, uh, celebrated by the U.S. So they I were speaking, they were just disagreeing. <laughs> <laughs> I wish they could put their act together and speak in unison. I think for us, that was counterproductive in so many, you know, on so many levels. Okay. I want to ask you one other question which goes in a slightly different direction. And maybe to frame this, uh, like many, I think, in the room, probably, you may have been a part of a religious institution when you were a kid. I was a part of a synagogue. And I finished my religious school education, and I approached something called confirmation, right? The end of your religious school education. And I was asked to give a speech at our confirmation ceremony. The problem was that I didn't believe in God. And so I went to the rabbi, and I said, I've got a real problem. I'm supposed to give this speech, but I don't believe in God. He said, I'm not sure I do either. <laughs> And that was like a big eye-opener for me. Um, and we had a sort of really interesting conversation about faith and, and when you have faith and when you lose faith. So I want to ask you about faith in the law, right, as opposed to faith in God. Um, and I want, I want to hear a little bit from your own perspective about how you maintain faith in the law and what would make you lose faith in the law. Because... You exist in an environment where, as you described, everyone in the judicial system has been appointed by the president, where if a judge decides to strike out on his or her own, they could expect to lose their appointment. Um, so at what point do you look at that system and say it's so broken as a mechanism for honoring the rights of people, either as reflected in the Constitution or that you believe are universal rights, that you say playing in this game of trying to enforce the rule of law no longer makes sense and you need to pursue some alternative to stand yourself as a political candidate, 
nonviolent civil disobedience on a mass scale, taking up guns to challenge the Museveni regime. These are all alternative pathways to affecting the kind of change that you want. So what sustains your faith in the law and when do you lose faith in the law? So the law is a tool, and like all other tools, they can only be effective to the extent that those who use the tools mean well. Uh, people of good faith, people of integrity, people who can uh, exercise discretion judiciously. And so my faith is not just in the law, but in the people who enforce the law. And I think the reason that we are where we are at uh, is because there are people within the system, uh, sometimes low-level mid-career individuals, who mean well and would go to the extent of risking their lives and their jobs to just do well. That is what keeps me going, the belief that in this broken system, there are moments of brightness. There are individuals in the system that uh, will do uh, what is right, uh, even at huge expense. I mean, sorry, at huge expense to their jobs and to their, uh, you know, sometimes lives. And so they keep me going. They are the people who speak to you quietly and say, I may be serving this government, I may be working in this system, but I don't believe what is being done. And who would give you information, would give you tips on what to do, who may give you uh, sometimes even secrets, uh, and you can be able to um, do what you can do. So I don't have a lot of faith in the law, but I have faith in the people that are working in the system who mean well and, and are able to uh, do what they're supposed to do. The other thing is to say that there are many options that we can take, as you mentioned, to confront this autocratic uh, regime in Kampala. But none of those options, in my view, should include violence. Taking up arms to fight the state, uh, I think that my country has bled enough. We have never had a peaceful transfer of power since the country got independence in 1962. Every other subsequent regime has come at the cost of a coup, uh, lives, disruption of people's lives. Um, so I don't think that my country, and certainly not myself, uh, having grown up in that kind of environment and seen the impact of war, um, should go back to a state where transfer of power must be by uh, armed rebellion or loss of lives. I believe in confronting the regime head on, using all possible means except violence. And that's why every day we go and litigate cases. We go and do a lot of advocacy work with uh, uh, development partners in Uganda. Because we believe that those options can still work and deliver. Uh, in terms of holding public office, I don't think that, and I'll be honest with you, if I contested for elections in my village, I probably have a good chance of becoming an MP, member of parliament. But I don't think that in a system in which the MPs work, I'm able to achieve what I'm uh, doing right now. In fact, if I were in parliament, I would have achieved, I would have achieved less than, 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 than what I've been able to achieve, precisely because the system of elections, the system of running government is just, uh, in, you know, in terms of lawmaking, it's not efficient. And I would rather have the social capital and influence to make the MPs do what I want them to do, as opposed to be one of them. And so the investments that we have had is creating networks and systems that have influence on the levers of power. And, and I tell you, I'll give you an example. In 2005, I drafted the country's Prevention and Prohibition of Torture Act, a law that was long overdue, but that nobody in parliament wanted to do, and put together a group of uh, organizations and individuals that advocated for this law. And the MPs did what we wanted them to do. And that law is now a law in the country. I don't think that if I were an MP, I would have done that uh, on my own uh, being in parliament. So I don't think that elections are necessarily what I want to use as a platform for change but having the influence on the levers of power, because power really is not the office, it's not the physical office. Uh, power is the ability to be able to uh, make formal systems of government do what you think is right, what you think they should do. And I think that my investment and time 
is in understanding that lever of power and being able to use it to influence the country. And I think that that perhaps in the long term will work. My bet is on it working. That's great. That's a very inspiring answer, I think, to that question. I want to turn it over to you. I'd ask, as you take the microphone, uh, to ask your question, that you introduce yourself, tell us what year or what program you're in at Stanford, what you're studying, and who wants to start us off with a question for Nicholas. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Ben. I am a first year master's student in East Asian studies. Um, I study LGBTQ issues in Japan. Um, so specifically, kind of in terms of law and how you approach cases about LGBTQ individuals, if there is no precedent set in your country yet for a law, uh, for you know, an, an issue like marriage or some sort of equality, what, how, how do you approach uh, cases like that? Do you use something within your own country? Do you look outside to an international kind of stage to set a precedent? Or wh how do you think you would approach those types of cases or issues? Well, first of all, the Ugandan constitution is one of the most progressive constitutions, right? At least in theory. And in the Bill of Rights contained in chapter four of our constitution, it captures uh, the international human rights uh, language, uh, the corpus of rights and the things that you know, you'd expect in any uh, law like that. So in terms of law, there are actually laws that prohibit non-discrimination, that talks about privacy. Uh, and so the law itself as a, as a law uh, is not a problem uh, in terms of providing for the corpus of rights. What is in fact the problem is the limited application and interpretation of the law by people who are supposed to apply the law. Um, and the challenge you have to do is to try and expand their mind and make sure that they interpret those provisions uh, in the broadest way possible. And, and, and the second thing is that we, as a common law country, draw what we call precedents. Uh, our judges uh, are very conservative. They look at what other judges have said before them and hold similarly. And so there are many common law countries that have decisions that are very helpful to us. So we've used a lot of cases from South Africa, from Australia, from Canada, uh, less, less in the US. The US system is a bit uh, complicated for us. But, but those countries provide inspiration and give us judicial decisions that we can use. The second uh, source of law that we use in the courts is, is really soft law. In respect to the LGBTI issue, we have had some very progressive uh, soft law uh, decisions from, say, for example, the UN Human Rights Council, from, uh, say, for example, the Inter-American Human Rights uh, Court, or in fact, even from the African Commission, you know, we're not yet you know, uh, progressive, but at least there's some decisions uh, from, from those uh, areas where we can use to influence the court system in Uganda. But like I said, the problem really is not the law. Uh, the problem largely is the application of legal principles in a very homophobic country like like Uganda and courts and, 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 and um, people in government, and, you know, how they apply the law uh, determines really how uh, these issues are handled in, in any system of government. So I think that besides, lit you know, besides litigation, there's also a lot of advocacy work. I mentioned that sometimes we go to court not to win because winning is not our objective in the court. And using that space creatively uh, in ways that puts pressure on the courts, puts pressure on the system. Um, sometimes our justice, what we think is our justice, is not in the four walls of the court, it's outside. The court is just a stage where we set out these issues. And so using the courts creatively, using the law as a springboard for other uh, extra judicial, in the positive sense, way, <laughs> not in the sense of killing without due process, but 
processes outside of the judiciary that would give you uh, a lot of a lot of leverage. So lots of training, for example, of judicial officers. I had the most amazing experience. One of my staff members going to a training of the prosecutors from all over the country. And she came back to office and said the prosecutors were extremely hostile and felt they were trapped because they were called for this human rights training and they were being trained by an open lesbian woman who had no apologies about being lesbian. And she had to go through a three hour process of training prosecutors about the rights of uh, her community. And so yeah, we do, besides cases, uh, there's work outside court that we do trainings and stuff like that. Good. Another question, maybe over here. Twinger, in the front. Yeah. Oh. Hi, my name is Nathaniel. I'm majoring in international relations, and uh, I'm here with the Islamic Studies Department. Um, and I was just curious, um, just hearing you comment earlier about lack of social media freedom. Um, I know that a lot of the, the social media that has made it to the West, unfortunately, from Uganda has been very like, outrageous. And um, throughout the world, that there's definitely a pattern of social media um, focusing on, uh, or I, I should say people choosing to make viral um, content that is more outrageous than more moving towards progress. Um, do you think that there is a way for when social media is more free for that for domestic positive domestic change to occur as a result of it? Or do you think that it will lead in a similar direction as, um, say, the way that social media has led to um, revolution in the Arab Spring and to more bloodshed? Well, first of all, I like your hair. Uh, <laughs> I wish I could grow mine like that. Um, I, mine grows in patches. So. <laughs> But, but to your question, it's a double-edged sword. Social media is empowering. In fact, it is the only space that the country's LGBTI community organizes in. They are closed Facebook groups. They are closed WhatsApp groups. That is a space where people feel free to express themselves, to mobilize. And in that sense, it, it's been extremely useful. But like it's the nature of social media, it can also empower homophobic groups, hate groups, and all kinds of, of kind, all kinds of people. So I think it's a double-edged sword. Uh, there's just no one answer to how social media can become the space that promotes only good. Because in a sense, it gives a megaphone to anyone. Um, and I think we're all still grappling with how we can make it a, a responsible community uh, that, that doesn't promote hate crimes. And, and I think the responsibility of doing that now lies on the shoulders of you know, uh, governments and, and these big tech companies. And how that is going to play out, I have no idea. But in terms of social media rights in Uganda, and I think what is making the regime in Kampala um, really scared is the ability of social media to be a space for organizing. We've had protests in, in Uganda, not in the scale of the Sudan, uh, the Sudan is exceptional. Um, but in, in, in terms of our context, that space has been used creatively uh, to push back on a number of things. I'll give you one example. For the very first time in Uganda, there was a women's march last year that became a space for women from all walks of life to just come in one space and express themselves. So you had commercial sex workers, you had the country's uh, lesbian community, you had uh, other women rights groups just coming together to have this march that lasted four hours, had way over a thousand people. A thousand in our context is really big. You know, had the US ambassador, had the French ambassador. That entire march and mobilization for that march was purely done on social media and was only able to be held because the authorities felt the pressure that was being exerted on them on social media. And so social media is a powerful tool, but in my view, can also be a double-edged sword. It can cut either way. And in the context of Uganda, we are still um, not at the level where we think that is going to be the spark for, say, a revolution in the sense of what happened in Egypt or what did happen recently in the Sudan. Um, but it's a growing community, and I think the response of the state 
uh, only speaks to the fact that they are afraid of the power it has as, as, a, as, as, as a space for mobilizing uh, in my country. Great. Yeah, up here, up front. Thank you. Um, my name is Mason. Um, I major in electrical engineering. Uh, I'm here with the Center of African Studies. Um, first of all, I'd like to appreciate all the words that you've spoken about. Um, I, it's, it's really incredible to be here. I also think it's beautiful to be in the presence of all of you who not only stand for these principles but are invested in this region. Um, my, my question is more in regards to the region, East Africa. Um, have, having been born in Tan and, and raised in Tanzania, I think, uh, as, and as a young person, I want to be hopeful and optimistic about the future of the region. But I also want to understand where it's heading more realistically. Like in Tanzania, just a few months ago, uh, there was what, what a lot of people are referring to as the Enabling Act, where the government has instituted this law that is essentially going to police all these other political parties in the country. Um, so I want to hear from you as somebody who's been involved in the grassroots movements in the region and who is aware of the work that all the young people are doing. Um, where, what do you see as the future of East Africa in the next five years and uh, the kind of role that young people can play in adding value in uh, just making this something that we all want to be hopeful about? I am a very optimistic person, so I like to look at the future as bright. But I think that looking at events in East Africa, I think the East African community now is at its weakest. If you look at the retrogression in Tanzania, what Magufuli has been doing in Tanzania is the complete opposite of what we had expected in Tanzania over the last couple of years. The jailing of social media activists. The, one of my friends who was the president of the Law Society had his office bombed simply because he called uh, the leader um, you know, a small dictator. And so what, what, what is happening in, in Tanzania is not hopeful. If you look further to the west of Tanzania, what's happening in Burundi, the perversion of democratic processes uh, for one man rule, for the continued uh, hanging on to power by one man in, in Burundi at the cost of you know, people's lives, uh, doesn't give me a lot of hope uh, in, in what I see as the direction of the country. If you look to our new member of this African community in the Sudan, I mean, sorry, South Sudan, I think South Sudan is a basket case of just a failed new state. Um, and so I don't think that I look at the future of the East African community as a community, as a political community, as being very bright. Uh, what I do hope and have hope in is the young people in the region. First of all, speaking for Uganda, it's, it's a country that has, uh, the majority of them are young people. 78% of, of the population are people below the age of 35. That's an extremely young population. And these young people don't care about the past. They care more about the future. They have no idea about Museveni's wars in the bushes of Luero in 1980 to 1985. What they care about is jobs. What they care about is you know, education, schools, healthcare. And if they don't see it, they're becoming increasingly uh, more agitated and becoming you know, louder and louder. So I think that the hope for me lies in our demographics, a young, empowered, civically engaged young population, uh, I think is the only hope that the region has for um, meaningful change. The question is, do we see our struggles as connected? Do we have young people connecting in the region and, and, and seeing their workers um, as reinforcing of each other? I had the fortune of traveling with uh, Bobby Wine or Robert Chagolani, the young musician who has now you know, captured the imagination of the country, to Kenya uh, last year. And I think I saw many more young people come forward to meet him, to engage with him, to discuss with him the future of East Africa, uh, more than I had seen people in Uganda. Partly because you know, he was free to organize in Kenya, but also partly because the Kenyan young people uh, are just so engaged. And so connecting our struggles and being able to have 
an East African youth movement that looks at the future of the region, perhaps for me is the only hope that I see for the region. The last one, and I think for me this is perhaps addressed to you as a former uh, federal government uh, official, is that... Retired. Yeah, <laughs> emeritus. Um, the, and, I, and I'm really sorry to pick on you. I know it's not a good time to be associated with the federal government. <laughs> but the point is that international blocks must re-examine their relationship with the region. President Clinton administration described Museveni and Kagame Mele Zinawe as the new breed of African leaders. I think they were mistaken. With the benefit of hindsight, now we can agree that all of these people turned out to be not the, what they expected them to be. They are completely different from what they had hoped they would turn out to be. And so we must re-examine our relationship with the regional strongmen who hold power, who, um, um, in particular Museveni, still the longest serving leader in the East African community. One of the last surviving, the only surviving signatories to the East African community. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a question of how do we relate to the region? What do we see in the region as, as important to engage with? And I like to scare people when I, I tell them, I said, long-term US interest is better protected, not by a strong strongman in Uganda, but by a more democratic society, a more open society. For as long as you don't have an, an, an open society, we will continue to have refugees wash up on your shores in the US or in Europe. Uh, that's a fact. People are going to run over here. Uh, for as long as you don't uh, make our country accountable, we'll have Ebola cases getting onto a flight and coming to the US. Um, and so focusing on long-term interest of regional blocs uh, must be premised on the principle that that can only be safeguarded by a more democratic open society. And that will call for them to re-examine uh, how they relate with uh, people like President Museveni in East Africa. I just want I have to ask a follow-up question, not to defend the federal government or <laughs> Obama or anything. It's, it's actually about your faith in democracy as opposed to your faith in the law. So one of the statistics that I often show uh, when I'm teaching Stanford undergraduates is that if you poll people under the age of 35 uh, in advanced economies, Europe and the United States, what you've seen over the last decade is a declining faith in democracy as the form of government that is the best form of government. People don't say what they would prefer to democracy, and in most of these environments, people haven't had an experience of anything other than democracy, but now more than a quarter of young people say that democracy is not the best form of government for their country. So you obviously see when you're living here and when you listen to the BBC and hear about Brexit and read the newspapers and look at what's happening in Europe and the United States, that democracy is having its own growing pains, not the kinds of growing pains that we used to think about uh, newly transitioning countries, but these are long-time democracies experiencing profound growing pains, democratic dysfunction, paralysis, polarization. Um, so just as a, a follow-up question to what you just said, why so much faith in democracy, that democracy is the, the set of institutions and rules that will actually provide the kinds of outcomes that you want for Ugandans and that you want for the region? when here in the United States and in Europe, we're seeing so much of the consequences of democratic dysfunction? That is a tough question, but let me, let me respond to it this way. That if you have lived in war, you have seen violent transfer of power. You have seen uh, forced disappearances, maiming of people, um, just to hang on to, to office the more attractive option is a more open society, is, 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 is a more democratic society. The only safety valve you have to leaders who hang on to power is the possibility that they may have access to the instruments of coercion, but that that in itself uh, can be uh, you know, removed from them in an election. And so the reason that I have a lot of faith 
in democracy as a system of governance is that it does provide safety valves. Even in dysfunctional democracies, even in all struggling democracies uh, in, you know, in, in the West, you still have the safety valves uh, to allow for that phase you know, to, be, to be changed. And I think that the belief that however dysfunction is, is, you have strong institutions that will try and push back. You have a fairly independent electoral process that even if you don't like the current US administration, the most you can suffer is eight years. Um, so I do think that those options are more attractive to us than the option of a regional strongman who will stay in power forever. Because the impact of long term in power, really, and take the case of Uganda just to explain to drive the point home, is that the longer President Museveni stays in power, the more repressive he becomes. Because he has to he has to demobilize the opposition. He has to stifle independent voices. He has to restrict civic space for NGOs in order for him to maintain his staying power, limit access to rural population, uh, limit free assembly. Um, but the second impact is that the public system to keep him in power, he has to drive off opponents, he has to uh, maintain a constituency. So the cost of uh, staying in power for long is that you have not just repression but corruption becoming the rule of the game. And so we see that as less attractive uh, because we've seen what um, war, what power transfer power can do. And then I think that we find democracy with all its weaknesses uh, uh, more attractive to us. And I think for me, my faith is that a democratic system with strong institutions will give us a safety valve, but also will protect us from what we have grown up uh, living in Uganda, war, instability, corruption, and repression. Great. We have time for a couple more questions. So, your uh, hands. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Hi. My name is Ryan. I'm uh, a physics major, second year undergraduate. I'm here with the South Asian Department. Um, so my question is, I guess in response to your previous answer about um, using the levers of power while not being a sitting MP yourself, and I was wondering, I was very curious to hear more details about that, about how, what carrot or stick you use as someone um, like through the judiciary or towards uh, the parliament, and how exactly you, I guess more details about how you effect that kind of change, what tools you use aside from the law. What's the secret sauce? <laughs> um, let me give you the secret, um, if I may. And to use an example of the country's LGBT law in 2015. The truth of the matter is that power panders to a source of power. And those in the office um, have fears in life, have weaknesses in life. Um, and so understanding those fears become really, really important. So the analysis of, of power and power, where power is derived from and power, how power is used uh, is important in understanding the other ways in which we in fact, um, that we in fact impact power. And the way that we use it to give you a practical example is when we certainly in spite of promising the Obama administration that we wouldn't sign the anti gay law and Uganda signed it. We quickly did an analysis of the largest donors to the country. And uh, we discovered that the World Bank is a very big financial to Uganda. And to just go to the World Bank and say, look, your money is being used to promote discrimination in the country. You're just about to sign a $10 million aid to help the health sector. But the health sector it's not providing treatment, access to medicine, to the country's LGBTI. And thankfully, the World Bank president, and without the approval of, of, of his board, his board learned about it in the Washington Post, <laughs> got an opinion which he says, you're suspending that aid to Uganda. And 
a country that needs the aid that is needs foreign aid subsidized is hugely inefficient and corrupt system. That's a very important matter. It's a very personal issue. So the World Bank just said, no, forget about it. If you want this money, do the following things. And we got the World Bank to appoint a team of consultants to evaluate the country's response to the World Bank visa. And in the end, um, uh, we did get what we wanted. The health sector completely opened its gates and allowed for access to treatment, access to uh, medicine for the country's LGBTI community. In fact, they even established um, a whole clinic at the National Referral Hospital that deals with what they call most at risk population. The National AIDS Commission uh, has programming, has uh, resources that deal with uh, sexual minorities in my country. The second example is what happened with the Scandinavian bloc, the most important and perhaps strongest partner to human rights work in Uganda has been the Scandinavian bloc. You have, you know, uh, countries like Norway, Denmark, Netherlands. And we were able to get them to speak in unison to say, from this day onwards, up until now, we are not giving any money for budget support to the country. So the behind the scene work in advocating for providing information, cajoling the people who give money to the Ghana state, did give us some 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 results. Uh, and so I think that the short response to your question is understanding the drivers of power. Uh, what places power would uh, respond to. President Museveni went to the Africa EU summit in Brussels and couldn't leave his hotel room. He couldn't leave his hotel room because we knew about his trip, mobilized people who were demonstrating against him in front of his hotel at the conference venue. He couldn't leave his room. In fact, he did meet Kagame in, in his hotel room and then flew back to Kampala. He was quite upset. Uh, so yes, understanding those things and making sure that you touch those buttons um, are extremely important. So we have time for one more question. Um, let's take the question in the back. Hello, uh, my name is Pierce. I'm in uh, the computer science program and the Iranian studies program here at Stanford. And I wanted to thank you, sir, for an incredibly um, inspiring and incredibly informative uh, presentation and for the honor of, um, of having you here uh, this evening. I wanted to ask you, from the perspective of perhaps ordinary citizens or even ordinary students, um, if there is anything that we could do perhaps to help those on the ground in nations such as Uganda that are suffering these abuses or that are agitating for, for change, is there anything that you would recommend we do or any way we can best help them in the present capacities that um, most of us, at least ordinary citizens, would have available to us. Thank you. Well, first of all, just educate yourself and know exactly what is happening. You know, coming to the Bay Area, I've just been astounded by the limited knowledge about my country and my region. Uh, so, I think you should spend more time at CAS than you do in science. Just hear and learn about what's happening on the continent. If I told you that the Sudan has had three presidents in the last one week, <laughs> many, many of you would think it's a joke, but that's the truth. So first of all, educate yourself, understand, know what's happening. Because if you don't know, you wouldn't care. Uh, and if you care, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you would really be unhelpful uh, in, in doing what you're doing. And so just understand, learn, have interest in the region. Because whether you like it or not, Africa is the place to be in the next century. It, it's, it's, best, it's the best thing ever. <laughs> um, and if you haven't been, shame on you. <laughs> the second thing is to understand just what your government, um, your evangelical groups are doing in my country and, and try and have influence on them. There are people in the US Senate who are 
deeply um, tied to the Nusrani regime. I don't think people here know it. I don't think people here put enough pressure on them. Um, so if you know it, put pressure on them. Make sure that there's a US government response that's appropriate to what's happening in Uganda. Ensure that you call your senator. Make sure that Uganda is 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 discussed at the right places in government here. If you do that and influence your state policy and response to the region, uh, you would have done us a lot of a lot of uh, you know, good. Three emotions as as we sort of end our evening tonight. The first is uh, a profound sense of the privilege that we have to be with you this evening. Um, you know, the word was described honor. It's an honor to to be able to share this evening with you and to hear your perspectives and sharing your story, but it's also, I think, a privilege for all of us for you to speak so frankly and honestly about your perspective on the role of people who are not in Uganda. The things that you just described in answer to this question, I wish were words that people here lived by, um, but they're really important words to be spoken out loud about the importance of listening, about recognizing where you have power and influence and what it is you bring, but also where expertise and knowledge really reside. Those are really important things to be said, not only in a university environment, but in Silicon Valley, in the United States, in everywhere. Um, and so it feels like an enormous privilege. Um, the second thing is uh, sort of I feel tremendous inspiration when we have evenings like this. Um, I sometimes feel it during the day, too, um, <laughs> including when I'm teaching some of you in this room. But sort of being together with a group of people, sort of engaging seriously the experiences that you're bringing to the table, and also hearing the questions that you all are asking, thinking really hard about tough issues, uh, sort of reminds me why this is such a special institution, and this group of people we have uh, is so unique. Um, and then the third is just a feeling of gratefulness. Um, for the time that you give us, for the time that all of you give the communities that you're a part of on campus. Sometimes the English word fails me, um, but thank you very much. And to all the warm, loving fellows at CAS, um, I came here depressed. I was running away from the possibility of being arrested. Um, and I go back to Uganda re-energized, um, but even more re-energized to see your interest in uh, you know this kind of discussions here. So I mean, thank you as well. So please join me in thanking Nicholas for being with us.